Chapter 21, Origins of Modern Astronomy. Early History of Astronomy, the ancient Greeks used philosophical arguments to explain natural phenomena. They also used some observational data. Most ancient Greeks held a geocentric view of the universe. In the Earth-centered view, the Earth was a motionless sphere at the center of the universe. Stars were on a celestial sphere, which is a transparent hollow sphere around the Earth, and special, the celestial sphere turned daily around the Earth. Okay. And then, then there were also seven heavenly bodies, the planets high, who changed position in the sky. These seven wanderers included the Sun, the Moon, Mercury, through Saturn, excluding the Earth. Aristarchus, he lived uh, 312 to 230 BC, was the first Greek to profess a sun-centered or heliocentric universe. The planets exhibit an apparent westward drift called retrograde motion. It occurs as Earth with its faster orbital speed overtakes other planets. The Ptolemaic system, AD 141, is a geocentric model. To explain the retrograde motion, Ptolemy used two motions for the planets, large orbital circles called deferents and small circles called epicycles. So you only get this retrograde motion when Earth is in the center of the universe. So you have to explain it. Okay. So here, the Earth's at the center. The Moon orbits around the Earth. Mercury orbits around the Earth. But the Earth, we know, is actually orbiting at different speed. So at some point, Mercury has to do an extra little, almost like a penalty lap in the Olympic biathlon racing. Okay. Uh, here's Venus. It has its orbit. And here's its little, little uh, retrograde orbit here. Now over here, here's the Sun, and the Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, etc. Another one of the ancient Greeks actually able to calculate uh, fairly accurately the circumference of the Earth. Uh, Aristophanes, Aristophanes, he actually realized that a uh, well in Cyrene on uh, a spring solstice, uh, the Sun was visible. If you look into the well, the Sun fully re reflected off the water there. So he had someone walk from Cyrene to Alexandria to figure out how far these are apart. He should paste it out. And then on the spring solstice, then he, what he did is he looked at the shadow, this monument in Alexandria, you know, the library in Alexandria, and measured the, um, measured the shadow figure at the height of the post here. And he used some very simple geometry uh, in order to figure out the um, circumference of the Earth. He saw that this that the post makes a 7 degree angle, or 7 degree angle, and we're able to figure out what this, well, well it's the 70 degree angle is 1 50th of a circle, so 50 times this distance gave him the circumference around the Earth. In the 1500s and 1600s, we had five noted scientists, Nicholas Copernicus, in 1473 1543, he concluded Earth was a planet. He constructed a model of the solar system that put the sun at the center, but he used circular orbits for the planets. He, and he, that ushered out the old astronomy. Now, Tycho Brahe, he, um, 1546 to 1601, very precise observer. He tried to find stellar parallax, the apparent shift in a star's position due to revolution in the Earth. He didn't believe in the Copernican system because he was unable to observe the stellar parallax that he was expecting. Johannes Kepler, in 1571 to 1630, he ushered in new astronomy. The planets revolved around the sun, and he had three laws of planetary motion. I actually explained their orbits. So the orbits of the planets are elliptical, this is the first law, and that the planets revolve around the sun at different speeds. Okay. Now also, the third one is there's a proportional relationship between the planet's orbital period, and time it takes to go around the orbit, and its distance from the sun. And this is measured in astronomical units, or AUs, 1 AU, and which is about 150 million kilometers, or 93 million miles. It's the distance between the Earth and the Sun. So here's Kepler's law of equal areas. So as a uh, planet orbits around the Sun, its distance from the Sun remains proportional. So the area in the July slice of the pie here, that, that area is equal to the January area. Okay. Now, Galileo Galilei, he lived 1564 through 1642. He supported Copernican theory. He used experimental data. And he constructed an astronomical telescope in 1609. Four large 
He found four large moons of Jupiter. Uh, the plants look like disks. He knows that Venus has phases, like the moon has phases. He could see features on the moon, and he found sunspots on the sun. Sir Isaac Newton, 1643 to 1727, he developed the law of universal gravitation. He proved that the force of gravity, combined with the tendency of a plant to remain in a straight line of motion, results in elliptical orbits discovered by Kepler. The constellations, those are configurations of stars named in honor of mythological creatures or great heroes. The 88 constellations are recognized. Constellations are divided into, in the sky into units, like state boundaries in the United States. The brightest stars in the constellations are identified in the order of the brightness by the letters of the Greek alphabet. So the brightest stars are going to be the alpha star, the constellation, the beta star, and so on. Now the positions of the scar, sky, they, they appear to be fixed on a spherical shell of the celestial sphere that surrounds the Earth. It's because of how far away they actually are. They just kind of all look like the same distance. And with the equatorial system of locating uh, these, these stars and constellations on that sphere. So we developed a coordinate system similar to Earth's latitude and longitude. Okay, so the coordinate system divides the celestial sphere. Uh, two, there are two locational components. Declination is the angular distance north or south of the celestial equator. And right ascension is angular distance measured eastward along the celestial equator from the position of the vernal equinox. So here we got our celestial sphere. Okay, so there's a north celestial pole, south celestial pole. And you, and you look at the distance to the north as you're going up is declination. Okay, and traveling around to the right, you measure the right ascension. Here's a picture of the sun of the vernal equinox, which is March 21st. You look at the right ascension from the vernal equinox to get your right ascension value. And then you go up to get the declination. And there's your, your star. Okay, Earth, Earth's motions, two primary motions. It rotates, it turns or spins. The turning or spinning of the body on its axis. And uh, so at, we measure rotation by the mean solar day. So it's time interval from one noon to the next, which is about 24 hours. Sidereal day is the time it takes Earth to make one complete rotation, full 360 degrees with respect to a star other than the sun. So that makes her day just a little shorter, 23 hours, 56 minutes, and 4 seconds. Right here. We have the sun's way over here, and out here are the distant stars. Okay, sun's noon rays would give us a 24-hour day. Okay, but there's a slight angle offset of the sun versus these other stars, so another star looks directly at the Earth. Our rotation is just under 24 hours. Revolution, that's the motion of body around, which is a planet or a moon, along a path around some point in space. So our orbit, our Earth's orbit is elliptical. Earth is, is the closest to the Sun in January. That's when Earth is at perhelion. Earth is farthest from the Sun, or 8 billion, in July. The plane of the ecliptic, uh, the ecliptic is an imaginary plane that connects Earth's orbit with the celestial sphere. It's like putting a, putting, sliding a piece of paper uh, through Earth's orbit and out to the celestial sphere. So here, here, um, the Earth is tilted. Okay. So here's a plane. We put a piece of paper through the Earth, through its Earth to the uh, equator, would be here. But that tilt of the Earth makes it so when you, when you pass paper through the plane of the ecliptic, it's going to be offset by 23 and a half degrees, and that's that the number of degrees it tilts on Earth's axis. Precession, the very slow Earth's movement, direction with Earth's Earth's axis points continually changes, so even though it's tilted at 23 and a half degrees, it kind of changes a little slightly as Earth kind of moves in precision. Movement with the solar system is in the direction of the star Vega. Okay. So the whole solar system is moving towards Vega. And then the whole solar system is revolving around the sun. I mean, I'm sorry, it's revolving with the sun around the galaxy. And moving with the galaxy, the whole galaxy is, is also moving within the universe. So everything's constantly in motion. So that gram of precision, so we still have that um, 23 and a half degree axis tilt, but it has a little bit of a wobble. So that degree, the tilt's going to slightly change. Okay. Um, 
and, it's, and the Earth's actually, well, Earth's actually rotating. So what will happen is we'll actually see the axis is pointing right at Polaris. So we'll actually see the stars spin in the night sky over the time. If you open up the camera for a very long shutter speed of an hour or two, you'll see that the stars are moving. And you keep open, um, not sure for how long, but most of the night, you'll end up with a circular picture of stars. So here, you open up your camera, and for several hours, um, you just have the shutter wide open. And you'll see how the, the stars appear to, to revolve in a circle above us. That's really our position. We're pointing at the North Star, and then the Earth is, re, re, is, is uh, you know, it's rotating. Moon, moons, let's see, motion of the Earth-Moon system, phases of the Moon, when viewed from above the North Pole, the Moon orbits the Earth in a counterclockwise direction. The relative positions of the Earth, Sun, and Moon constantly change. This gives us our lunar phases. So the consequence of this motion of the Moon and the sunlight that reflects from its surface shows, allows us to see different parts of the Moon, different parts of the month. So beginning of the month, we have a new moon. I'm sorry, beginning of the lunar month, we have a new moon. So the, um, the sun's over here, and the Earth's over here, the moon's in between. So we're not seeing reflected surface off the moon. We're seeing the moon totally in shadow, so we don't see it. And then um, you know, about a week later, we have a crescent, a waxing moon. We start seeing a little sliver of the moon, like reflected off the moon. And then the first quarter, for two weeks into a month, we see half the moon. And then give us waxing, we'll see three quarters of the moon. And then, then um, halfway through the month, we see a full moon. Okay. So I guess it's about a week, two weeks into the month, actually. So we see the full moon. This is, all this light's been reflected from the sun. And it bounce back up here. And then, then uh, give us waning. So it's a, with a portion that we see that's lit up is starting to get smaller. Okay, so see three quarters, and then here we'll see um, one half, and then crescent waning, we'll see just a sliver here, and then we're back to the, the next lunar month. This syn synodic month is uh, cycles of the Earth's phases. It takes 29 and a half days to get through that whole lunar month cycle of phases. Sidereal month is a true period of the Moon's revolution around the Earth. It actually takes the moon 27 and a third days to get all the way around the Earth. Just visually, in the lunar phases, it looks like it's 29 and a half. Okay, so here we have Earth's orbit. The Earth's traveling like this around the sun. Okay, so here's a new moon. The moon is rotating around the Earth. Okay. Okay, so apparently it looks so it gets all the way to about here to have that same visual effect as it did from here. Okay, because the draw line from the sun through the moon. New moon, like the sun to the through the moon to the earth, another new moon. But in effect, if the earth wasn't moving around, it would have reached all the way all the way around at this point. So it wouldn't have this like parallax here. Okay. Difference between two days between synodic and sidereal cycles is due to the Earth Moon system also moving in the orbit around the sun. The moon's period of rotation on its axis and its revolution around the earth are the same. Twenty three maybe twenty seven and third days causes the same lunar hemisphere to always face the Earth. Okay, so we don't see the dark side of the moon another, um, so to speak. Okay, eclipses. This, this is simply a shadow effect that were first understood by the early Greeks. Two types of eclipse. The solar eclipse, the moon moves in a line directly between the Earth and the Sun, can only occur during the new moon phase. Okay, so here we have the Sun. Now the Sun's on this side of our diagram here, and the Earth's over here. Okay, and it's the, um, this, the moon is actually casting a shadow on the Earth. And the deepest part of the shadow is in the umbra. Okay, and there's no there's no light wrapping around. Okay. And the penumbra, there is some 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 light passing into that shadow area. So it's a lighter portion of the um, of the um, lunar eclipse. I mean sorry, solar eclipse. And this solar eclipse is going to travel through the course of, of the day or for a little while. So it's going to travel in this case in this direction because the Earth is rotating in this direction. And here's a picture of what the solar eclipse would look like from the Earth. Now, lunar eclipse, the moon moves within the shadow of the Earth, and only occurs during the full moon phase. For any eclipse to take place, the moon must be in the plane of the ecliptic at the time of new or full moon. Okay, so it's kind of that plane, like plane that we have with the celestial sphere. Because the moon's orbit is inclined about 5 degrees to the plane of the ecliptic, during most of the times, the new and full moon, the moon is above or below the plane, so there's no eclipse. 
the usual number of eclipses is about four per year. So here we have the sun and the moon, and the sun and the earth are on the same side. So the, the earth is casting a shadow on the moon. It's blocking some of that sunlight. Okay, so then, so then we actually have very little sunlight reflecting off the moon, but kind of casts this orangish uh, glow. Okay, the umbra is the darker part of the shadow, and penumbra is where there's a little bit of, of light escaping.